start recording. All right, I want to welcome all of you to uh, our Polar Connect event. We're really excited to be talking with uh, uh, the Polar Trek team that is somewhere in the North Chukchi Sea. We'll hear more about exactly where they are today. Um, they're going to be talking about the work they've been doing the last uh, couple of weeks and today is August 20th, 2019. Um, our event here is uh, hosted by the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. I'm presenting for you today. This is Janet Warburton and I'm assisted with Judy Fonstock. Um, we'd like you all to introduce yourselves in the uh, chat box area. Just let us know where you're coming from. Um, today's event, there won't be any video of the research team due to the where they're located and on the ship. It uh, doesn't have the bandwidth today. And um, uh, so today, most of it will be audio and we um, will be sharing slides over the internet. So our team is part of the Polar Trek program. Uh, Piper uh, joined us this last year, but uh, Polar Trek has been around for a while. We started in 2004 and we're funded by the National Science Foundation and we're administered by the uh, Arcus. Um, it's a program where we place educators like Piper and others with scientists like Dr. Lee Cooper and Dr. Jackie Grebmeyer in crazy remote and fun and interesting science locations in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And we've been placing educators um, for um, like since 2004. We have over um, close to almost 200 now. Um, so today's presentation, like I mentioned just a little bit ago, we won't have the option for video, so you won't get to see the team, but Piper's been putting great photos of her team on her journals, so you can catch a glimpse of your favorite scientist or educator there. Um, but during the presentation, if you do have questions, you can type them in the chat box, and at the end, you can also ask your questions live if you want to. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to turn this over to Piper after I unmute everybody on the Healy and they can introduce themselves and tell us uh, where they are and what they're up to. So Piper, it's all up to you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, so my name is Piper Bartlett Brown. Um, I'm here with Dr. Lee Cooper, um, and I'm here with also former uh, MSO Marine Science Officer um, Carly Gilligan, um, who is with the U.S. Coast Guard here on the ship. Um, so if you have any Coast Guard questions, we can tap her in a little bit later for that. Um, we are aboard the U.S. Coast Guard cutter, the Healy, uh, which is a 420-foot um, icebreaker. And we were, were in the Bering and mainly the Chukchi Sea. Um, so we started in Nome. So that picture down there on the bottom left um, is a couple of us getting ready to board the small ship, um, which you see on the bottom right, uh, to actually go out to the um, ship because uh, it was actually outsported or it was um, sitting outside of Nome so we had to take a little small boat with the Coast Guard to get out there. Um, we were delayed a few days because of weather but we got there um, and so our trip uh, started in Nome and we went south towards St. Lawrence Island so the map up at the top you can kind of see um, those red boxes which I'll talk about on the next slide are part of the DBO or the Distributed Biological Observatory um, which were the areas that we were sampling um, and doing some research in those spaces so that's kind of the track of where this ship went um, so again we went south and then headed up north and right now we're sitting um, above Barrow um, right now. So, um, and one other thing I want to mention too is this is really a science and Coast Guard um, collaborative effort. So the Coast Guard have been really fabulous um, in helping us really do a lot of science on the ship and keeping things um, running smoothly. So it's been a really great opportunity to bring those two groups together, um, Coast Guard and scientists, um, to really um, make an impact and do some really great science. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Take a second, maybe. No? Are we on the next slide? Mm -hmm. There yes. we go. Thank you. 
<laughs> awesome. Okay, there may be a little bit of a delay. Um, so the DBO, again, like I said, is the Distributed Biological Observatory, um, and it's a series of locations um, that have been chosen throughout the Arctic, the Bering and the Chukchi Sea, um, that have been chosen for their high biodiversity and biomass. Um, these areas have been studied for about 30 years by Dr. Lee Cooper and, and Dr. Jackie Grebmeyer, who's here somewhere. Oh, she's behind me. Um, <laughs> she's behind me. Um, and so, uh, again, these areas have been chosen for this biodiversity and biomass. So um, the whole idea behind this project is to work together um, as multiple or different research teams. Um, if you look on the last slide, there were eight actual DBO lines or stations, um, but we actually have completed five on this expedition. So um, we haven't done all eight, but we've done five of them. Um, and these areas are studied by different facets of marine science. So we've got folks on the ship that are working with atmospheric data. Um, the Benthic team, which is the team that I'm um, assigned to mostly, um, and that's Dr. Lee Cooper and Dr. Jackie Grebmeyer. And then we've got physical oceanography, chemical oceanography. Uh, there's moorings, there's sail drones, which I'll talk a little bit about, and all of these different projects. So all of this research um, comes together and looks at these areas, these really high productive or high biodiversity and biomass areas in the Arctic um, to try to get this really big picture um, of what's happening in this ecosystem. So it's this really awesome collaborative um, group of scientists on this ship going through these um, DBO lines to try to figure out what's going on. Um, and so it's really interesting to, to see how everybody works together um, and and try, trying to you know come up with a common goal here uh i do i will say i i will talk a little bit about some of the research projects but there's a lot of other ones that i'm not even going to get to on here so if you're interested more in the dbo and some of the other things that are happening um, that i don't mention in this webinar i would go to my blog um, on the polar trek website and i talk a little bit more in depth about some other ones as well um next slide please <laughs> Yeah, because it's downloading the video. Yeah. So. <laughs> Talking on the ship is tricky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk first about the Benthic team, which again is what my, I, I'm primarily uh, assigned to. Um, and we do a lot of different stuff and our team is relatively big so up there on the top left um, is actually only a few members of our team we're missing dr lee cooper who's taking the picture uh, and we're missing also two other members um, who are a part of the night crew um, so the science on the ship really happens 24 hours a day um, and it really depends on what station we're on or when we get to things so we could end up um, at a station at 2 a.m and the night team is on that and is, is going to be taking care of that. Um, so we kind of rotate throughout the 24 hours and it really, like I said, just depends on when we end up at a station and when we're doing the research. Um, so there's two folks missing um, from, or three folks missing from the Benthic team in that photo. Um, so what we do, um, we're looking at uh, pro productivity, biodiversity, biomass, oxygen demand, um, all in the benthic areas of the Arctic, which means the bottom of the ocean. So we are basically taking up mud from the bottom. Um, and I'll talk about the two ways that we've been doing that and looking at those things. So looking at these organisms, um, they all get collected to go back to a lab um, and biomass um, is calculated um, from there, which is really cool. And these are just some pictures of organisms that we found. So we've got our snow crab out there, found him. And then uh, in the bottom right, there's the sieve box, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. Um, basically just taking a hose to the organisms and expose they can be collected on this one meter sieve. So a lot of um, and, and uh, brittle stars and a bunch of other things, which are pretty cool. Um, and then we've got our little tagged sea star there. Um, he was very popular. He put him in a little jar and then um, we set him free. So that, that was kind of cool. Um, yeah, so that's what we're doing. So there's two ways that we really look at these, um, these aspects of the benthic community. Um, and I'll talk about those in the next two slides. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Thinking. Um, all right, so Van Veen grabs um, is the first thing that we do here, and you can see that on the right side of the screen there. Um, this is actually taken on a really beautiful calm day, as you can see. Um, and it's basically just this giant claw uh, looking thing, and it 
grabs 0 0.1 meters square of mud from the bottom of the ocean. Um, and it has these really heavy weights on the top of it so that it goes down into the mud and then it will, when it's lifted back up, will automatically close. Um, so it weighs about 117 pounds um, when it's empty. And then um, when it closes and brings up this mud, um, we take the contents of that and we put it into the sieve box, which you can see is shown on the left there. And we basically just lightly hose down these organisms so that we can get rid of the mud um, and expose what's there so we can take a look to see what's going on with biodiversity. And then they get collected and taken back to the lab and biomass is collected from that. So we're doing that um, pretty often as we're going through these DBO lines um, and getting a lot of really cool stuff. Sometimes the sediment changes, so sometimes it's really muddy, Sometimes it's really rocky. Um, it really depends. So if it's a really sandy um, bottom, we know that the currents are relatively slow because that sediment is allowed to kind of sit or uh, drift down um, and land on the bottom. Um, whereas if we're getting a rocky area, we know that the current is relatively fast there because those light sediments, that mud isn't really allowed to settle. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, so the second thing, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, are what are called HAPS cores. Um, and these take uh, vertical mud samples um, that include the organisms that live there. So if you look at that picture of that HAPS core going down, um, it's a mud, uh, basically a metal tube with a plastic insert. So the plastic insert's clear and you can see through it. And that's what we're holding there on the bottom, uh, a couple of us from the benthic team. Um, that core goes down and it has big lead weights on the top. Um, and once it hits the bottom, it sinks down. And then again, once it's lifted up, there's a mechanism that basically puts a little foot underneath that tube um, so that the mud stays in there and then it's brought up to the surface. So you get this basically little puncture, this little vertical mud sample um, of the mud and the organisms that are living in that mud and it's striated. So the top stays on the top, the bottom mud stays on the bottom and you get this really cool view of that environment. Um, so what the team does with this is measuring the rate of oxygen or respiration, the organisms that are breathing um, by these benthic animals um, in the samples. Um, and so by looking at how much these organisms are breathing, you're generally able to kind of correlate that with how much food supply they're getting. So if they're respiring or breathing a lot more, um, it usually means that we're getting, um, there's a lot more food supply for them, which is a good thing. We want these organisms to have a healthy environment. Um, and get enough food for them to survive. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now I'm going to kind of get into some of the other research that's happening on the ship. Um, one of the big pieces of equipment that's here is something called a CTD. Um, uh, set flight quarters oh. position one, secure all doors and hands <laughs> after frame nine and six. Weather decks are secured after frame nine and six. Remove all hats top side. Smoking lamp is extinguished. <laughs> Following is a test of the flight crash alarm. One Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah. They're still going. Okay. Yeah. So there's some operations happening. There's some moorings going on in the back. So we might get some more announcements. Um, and there's a, also a lot of people in this room right now. So we're all. Um, yeah, so CTD is one of the big pieces of equipment that's on the ship. Um, this stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. Um, and these are taken throughout the expedition to complement the data collected by the research teams. So conductivity is really um, looking for salinity. Um, so water that has more conductivity is more saline or has more salt. Um, temperature we're looking at. And then again, depth. And um, these are taken throughout all of these sampling stations um, so that they can, again, be correlated with this research. Um, so if you look at the picture on the bottom there, the actual sensors are underneath this big giant structure. Um, you can see me standing actually on top of it. So it's pretty tall. Um, and there are tw 24 what are called Niskin bottles that sit around this sensor on the top. Um, and they're collecting water at different depths with those Niskin bottles. So depending on who's looking at what, um, they'll actually have all of these bottles open when they go down and then they get triggered um, on the way up to actually close up and collect water at different depths, which is pretty neat. So there are teams that are looking at primary productivity, um, acidification, algal blooms, and all kinds of stuff with these water samples. Um, so it's a really, really neat thing to, to watch go down and then go out and actually collect the water from the bottles. So it's pretty neat. Um, so there's that. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
Perfect. Um, so this is actually what pops up um, when we run the CTD. So in the lab, there's a screen that shows um, this lovely graph of data, which I had to shrink this down so the quality is not that great. But um, you get an idea of what this data actually looks like when you put this CTD um, down into the water. Um, the Chuck GC is really only, the average depth is only 80 meters um, or 260 feet. So we're really dropping this thing down 45 meters to maybe 150 kind of thing um, throughout this whole expedition. Um, so it's not going down super deep um, and they're stopping it right for the bottom so it doesn't hit anything. Um, but you can see how the salinity, temperature, um, and actually the oxygen levels will change as you go down um, into the water column. And this one is actually a 3000 meter. Um, this was actually our, our deepest uh, CTD that we took. Um, this was in the northern part of the Chukchi Sea. Um, and it's pretty interesting. So I went down 3000 meters, which is really crazy. It was really cool to see. Um, yeah, so this is the data that we're, we're getting from this um, information here from the CTD. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the other uh, teams that are here uh, are the plankton team. Um, so this is Janet Duffy Anderson um, from NOAA, uh, Jan Benson and Chrissy Hayes. They're really looking at fish larvae in plankton nets. Um, so if you look at the top picture there, they have what are called bongo nets um, that they'll drag behind the boat to try to collect um, plankton. Uh, plankton is really anything in the water column that's floating, um, but there, so that's, you know, jellyfish, um, uh, krill, um, and then fish larvae, which is what they're specifically looking at. So they're looking at Arctic cod, um, and they're looking at distribution and abundance. So they want to know where it is, how much of it are there, or how much is there. Um, and their data is going to help determine um, if this Arctic cod or other Arctic fish species are being outcompeted um, by a subarctic species that are coming up from the south um, with some of the warmer waters that we're seeing here in the Arctic. Um, so Arctic cod, like cold water um, and so climate change is warming those bottom temperatures um, and the population may be at risk of declining. So they're looking to see how um, that distribution is changing um, either by the water temperature changes or again those species coming up from the north that are um, used to warm water and they're kind of just following that warm water up here into the north so their range is changing a little bit. Um, so that's one team that's working. Um, next slide please. Um, one of the other uh, groups that are here are the Harmful Algal Bloom Group, um, or HABS is what we like to call it. Um, this is Evie Fashon, um, Anna Apostle, and Victoria Uva. Um, and they are at the, from the Anderson Lab at Woods Hole, and they're looking at the harmful algal blooms. Um, in particular, they're looking at Alexandrium catanella. Um, and so what they're doing is they're collecting water samples um, from the CTD and also from the ship's underway system. And they're trying to kind of figure out and locate where these harmful algal blooms are. Um, so HABs or harmful algal blooms are photosynthetic. Um, so when we lose all of this sea ice with the warm warming sea temperatures, um, they have more access to sunlight and warmer seas. So it's increasing um, the frequency and um, the time of the bloom, basically. So they're happening more often and they're happening for a longer amount of time. Um, and so they're looking to see how this is um, happening here in the Arctic. Um, the Alexandrium species that they're looking at, specifically this Cantonella, um, causes paralytic shellfish poisoning, um, which can get into, um, there are shellfish that eat this, um, like clams and mussels and things like that, and then it gets into their systems, and then people or other animals can potentially eat it and get sick from it. So it's, a, it's an important research um, uh, piece of research that they're doing here. Um, the other interesting thing about Alexandrium um, is that they have overwintering cysts that live in the mud. So the benthic team, so our team with those Van Veen grabs have been taking mud samples for the HABS group um, so that they can take it back to the lab and look at the persistence or, or the density of those cysts in the mud as we kind of go along this DBO system. Um, and these cysts can, once the conditions improve, they'll reanimate and, and come back to life and create potentially a, a bloom. So um, they're looking at the mud too. So there's one way that the, the benthic uh, team is connected with some of these other research teams. Um, next slide, please. Um, so one of the really cool things um, that is happening on the ship too um, is something called sail drones. 
Um, this was a program that Jessica Cross from NOAA is um, heading up here on the ship. So I've been talking to her a lot about this. Um, these are drones that are wind powered. Um, so they move by wind and all of their sensors are solar energy powered. Um, these unmanned surface vehicles or USVs um, are 20 feet tall and 20 feet wide. So the picture on the top is us seeing it from the ship. Um, we kind of came together with one. Um, we met up with one of these in the ocean um, to calibrate the sensors that are on it. Um, so they don't look very big from far away, uh, but the picture on the bottom there is actually the sail drone team standing with those while they're docked. So they are pretty tall um, and they're very, very versatile. They can withstand a lot of extreme weather, like high winds um, and they travel pretty fast, which is really neat. Um, they're remote controlled and they spend May through October um, collecting data in the Arctic. Uh, the reason that they're not there in the winter time is because all of their sensors are solar powered and there's no sun in the winter. Um, so they're only there for a certain amount of time um, and they're basically told where to go. Um, uh, will be a test oh, yeah. Of the flight crash alarm. Yeah. Hands We're going to get a flight crash alarm now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so it doesn't travel in the winter now just because, <laughs> because of that. Okay. <laughs> um, so when we met up with this sail drone um, in the ocean, um, we did it to calibrate the sensors on it. So by basically taking um, samples just from the ship and then looking to see what the sail drone was saying with the sensors, um, we were able to kind of match them up or Jessica Cross was able to match them up um, to make sure that they were calibrated correctly. Um, there are at least 16 sensors on these sail drones and they can be um, categorized in three different ways. So uh, atmospheric, ocean surface and ocean subsurface uh, sensors. So there's quite a few um, pieces of equipment on these sail drones that can collect a lot of uh, data and information pretty efficiently, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, next, please. Um, one of the other things, and I know a lot of people have asked me about this, um, are the birds and mammals that we're seeing. So there are bird surveys happening um, uh, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, this is Charlie and Linnea Wright up here at the top, um, and they work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, and they're identifying and counting seabirds on the bridge, um, and they're looking at population densities and diversity. Um, so Alaska in particular has had a large bird die-off this year, um, and it's been and they've been collecting these now, animals. Ready, boat crew, land science conference lounge. Ready, boat crew, science conference lounge. All right, we might get some, we might get some <laughs> Coast Guard folks in here in about five minutes. Um, so they've had a large bird die off um, and starvation is likely the cause and that starvation can be caused by anything from disease to just lack of food. Um, and so they're, they're really looking at these uh, bird populations to see what is happening um, with them and what's maybe causing these large die-offs. Um, next, please. Um, marine mammals also uh, are being counted here uh, on the Healy. So we've seen some gray whales, um, which is there on the top left. Um, we've seen orcas. Uh, we've seen walrus uh, as well. Um, on the bottom yeah, left. All right. Perfect. Um, and then the bottom left uh, is potentially a fur seal, um, which was very far north of its range. Um, so that was kind of a unique thing to see. Um, but we've been seeing a lot of these organisms um, as we've been going along on the Healy through our DBO lines, which has been pretty cool. Um, next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about life on the Healy. Um, so it's, like I said, a 420 foot uh, Coast Guard ship. Um, we're assigned like three folks to a room. So I've got two other roommates that are also part of the Benthic team. Um, and we've got these, uh, I think I took a oh yeah, talk, the picture up at the top left there um, is a watertight door. Um, so those are everywhere on the ship. You've got to open them up and then close them when you pass through it. For those personnel not involved in flight quarters who would like to view the flight <laughs> operations, you may do so from the aft part of the bridge, internal to the bridge. Again, those persons wishing to view flight operations not involved may view the helo operations from the bridge. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have, there's four meals a day. There's things that you might not think that were that are here, like a store. Um, they have a barber shop. Um, they do morale events like trivia. Sumo wrestling was last weekend. That was pretty funny. 
Um, and uh, we've got a science lounge. So the picture down there on the bottom left is actually where I'm sitting right now with a whole bunch of people um, and projecting our, our webinar up here. Um, and so, and the picture there on the bottom right is actually a photo that I took from the bridge, um, which is where they steer the ship and where ship operations happen um, throughout the day. Um, and that's pretty cool. We're able to kind of go up there um, and that's where all the bird and mammal surveys are done from that kind of top point of the ship. Um, and it's a really great place to go and, um, check out and relax and stuff like that. Um, and like I said, there's 24 hour science team shifts. So it's, there's somebody up all the time. It's a pretty busy um, ship um, and it's really, really neat. Uh, next. Uh, and then just a one little mention about Coast Guard operations. So we are here with the Coast Guard. And like I said, it's this really great collaborative effort. Um, and it's really cool to see some of the things that they do kind of on a daily basis. Um, so they, we have a, uh, one of their little small boats there on the top right or the top left, excuse me, um, that they have to deploy for like moorings. Um, so moorings that we're recovering or putting out, um, they have to take that little, that little boat out and, and get stuff. Um, uh, on the back deck, so the bottom left there, um, that's where all the Van Veen grabs happen, the HAPS core. This is a picture of a mooring um, with their little floats. Um, all of that is really coordinated by uh, the Coast Guard folks on the back of the ship. So they do a lot and use all that heavy machinery, which is pretty cool. Um, and then that was the little ship that we had to take, the little boat there on the bottom right, um, to actually get to the ship from Nome. So that was us getting out of the harbor in Nome um, and getting on that. So, and then the top right, it was actually really cool. Um, we had to get a part. And so a plane basically flew over and dropped it into the ocean and that little Coast Guard boat had to go pick it up. Um, and it was just really neat to see. So they, they do a variety of different things and they've really been great about keeping the, the science going and keeping us on <laughs> all safe and on track. So pretty cool. And next slide, please. And then just uh, just a quick thanks to everyone. So Dr. Lee Cooper and Jackie Grebmeyer um, and the whole Benthic team have just been awesome at incorporating and uh, me and like being very welcoming and um, allowing me to, to kind of jump in on all kinds of stuff. So that's been great. Um, Jessica Cross, Janet Duffy Anderson, Evie Fashon, Charlie and Linnea Wright, all the other research parties. I've talked to so many that I haven't even mentioned here. Um, and they've just been like, fabulous and willing to talk to me and these researchers are really great about wanting to get the word out on their research and they're really passionate about what they do. So it's been really great working with them. Uh, Lindsay Lee Graham from NOAA. Um, she's actually a professional photographer and she has been letting me use some photos, which I appreciate. Um, and then Danielle, uh, Dr. Robert Picard, Trevor Lehman um, for making this webinar possible. They have, the three of them have done really great things to help me kind of get this off the ship um, and working. So, yeah. And next slide, I think is the last one. Second to last one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So join Polar Trek. You guys can participate in different ways. Um, follow expeditions. So there's other expeditions coming up. So there's 12 of us teachers actually going out. Um, and so, you know, make sure you're following other folks uh, as well. There's a bunch of people going out after me. Um, join the Polar Education email list. Some of you I'm sure are already on that. There's a bunch of resources. Um, if you know a teacher or researcher that would be interested, you know, put the word out to them. It's a really great experience and it's been amazing. Uh, or become a member of Arcus, which is the organization that runs this. So, yeah. Okay. I think I'm good. Yeah, thank you very much. If there are any questions, we'll do that. All right, very good. Um, so uh, there were some questions that came up. Um, and we loved the announcements, by the way, that was added to the live experience. Um, so our first question was, um, do, does the Coast Guard itself do any kind of science? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a Carly question. Carly. Come on. Come, come, I don't come think up, you can. Here. We're going to grab our, our MSO, our Marine Science Officer from the Coast Guard. She's going to answer that one for you. <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so theoretically, no, but um, we facilitate the science by bringing people on board to do the science um, on our ships. But Healy is actually unique for the Coast Guard. We're the only ship that's built for research. So um, 
it's rare to see research teams on other Coast Guard ships and Navy ships and things like that, but the Healy was specifically built for science, so um, that's kind of what we're out here to do, and hopefully that um, tradition lasts as, you know, times change and politics change, but that's what the Healy's mission is, and we're here to facilitate the research. So. Cool, thank you. Did that answer the question, I hope? <laughs> yes, it did. Um, okay, and it's sorry, I was looking at questions and it took me a moment to answer to you. Um, so another question, do you, uh, at each of the stations, are you doing the same thing over and over or do the stations vary? Um, uh, it wasn't, uh, can you, I guess, describe that a little bit more? Yeah, so at the stations, usually it, there's a there's an order of things that happen. So CTD will go down first, um, and then the bongo nets for the plankton team, and then the benthic team will do our thing. So it's usually Van Veen grabs, um, but it does vary. Like sometimes it'll be every other um, station. <laughs> Sorry. So many um, So sometimes it will depend. Um, sometimes we'll do every other. It's really what the researchers are looking for. Um, and they've all been to these DBO lines, so they kind of know like what is potentially here, um, what's worth getting, um, and and or what's you know what's going to be there, and it's if it's going to be worth doing the the um, trap, the van bean grabs, or the cores, or whatever. Um, so it does vary a little bit, but when all of those things happen, there is the order. So the CTD, bongo nets, and then the benthic team will go and do what they have to do, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, for like the HAPS core, I guess, uh, what is the depth, the minimum, maximum that you've been sampling? And it could be for, I guess, all of them. Uh, you just had the HAPS core up at that time. Uh, uh, yeah, Lee Cooper here. I, I think the question was how deep uh, do we put it in the water? And um, we, we've we been mostly working on in what we consider pretty shallow sediments, uh, um, 60 or 80 meters, so a couple hundred feet deep. Um, but it, 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 you can, uh, if you need to, send it down deeper. It's It's been down, uh, on not on this cruise, but we, we've sent it down to a thousand meters before on a few few special occasions. Yeah. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I guess related. What is kind of the maximum depth at that uh, the Chuck T is at, or your um, the area that you're cruising and sampling? Yeah. I can that again mm -hmm. the, the 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 chukchi and the bearing uh, shelves continental shelves they're the biggest continental shelves the united states has uh that we share with russia and so they're a huge area uh and we're mostly working on the shelf but we have been doing uh some work off the shelf in in deep water uh in what's canada basin so that's uh three thousand meters deep so ten thousand feet uh, so we last night we went over the cliff basically started out at 40 or 50 meters so a couple hundred feet and then ended up uh, in uh, two two thousand meters of water. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, another question that came up was what are some of the species that are you seeing moving north? Uh, see, do we have a fish person here? Moving north. Or jam? Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So we've got some some folks here. Yeah, I probably the fish would be the most interesting thing to talk about if you want to come and mention it. No? <laughs> yeah, Chrissy Hayes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna come over yeah, here. Yeah. Hold on, we're getting up uh, one of the plankton folks here. Uh, so just a quick mention: um, some of the species we are seeing move north are some of the Arctic cod species. So those are cold water associated species um, that we used to find when the ice was further south, sort of in the Bering Sea. Um, but now we're seeing those fish move north and being sort of replaced by a Pacific cod or other warmer water fish species. So that's a pretty stark example of some of the species we're seeing move. Awesome. Thanks, Great. Chrissy. Um, and Judy, uh, let me see if Judy wants to clarify her question more. Oh, yeah, specifically that was, um, when uh, Piper was talking about uh, fish larvae coming in and uh, uh, being replaced, uh, 
cod being replaced. So I kind of wondered if that was going to affect the cod fishery overall. That's a great question. Well, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, we Hold got. We're, we're, we're yeah. still investigating. That's not something we know at this point. Um, and there is a moratorium on fishing in the Arctic. It's a decades old moratorium on commercial fishing in the Arctic. But uh, and I would add that what uh, some of us have been involved in um, sort of international um, um, negotiations, uh, Jackie in particular, uh, with uh, international agreements to make sure that if fisheries develop in the Arctic, in the central Arctic Ocean, outside the 200 mile limit of any of the Arctic countries that, that that'll be a controlled process where, where all the countries would get together. So the, some of the research we're doing does have those international um, uh, implications. Okay, cool, thank you. Let's see, um, I, well, there was a comment that said uh, earlier, it looks like the sea has been quite calm. I wanted to know, have you seen any sea ice or were you in any sea ice? Not at all. Nope. Uh, the sea ice is at about 77 degrees north um, and the high, the, the farthest north we went was about 74 uh, degrees. So we have not seen any ice, not a, not a bit. Nope. Uh um, and according to uh, the people that have been on the ship a lot, like uh, Dr. Gremmeyer and Dr. Cooper, is that unusual or is that the norm? Was it, was it unusual? Was it, is it unusual oh yeah, to... this is very unusual. The, the, I think, uh, and the water temperatures are really unprecedentedly high for, for this time of year, for this far north. Uh, we're seeing a very uh, great deal of warm water and the sea ice extent where it is now, uh, it's possible we'll set a record this year. Uh, the, the minimum will be in September, uh, and uh, it's, we're certainly on track to be able to reach that record minimum, which was last set in 2012. And so there's a lot of sea ice disappearing. So uh, when you say it's warm, what's the, what's the temperature and what's that, what's that difference? I should probably call on the physical oceanographer. Uh, yeah, well, come, come, come up here. <laughs> <laughs> we got Dr. Robert Picard is going to answer that for you. Hi, this is Bob Picard. I'm a physical oceanographer. Uh, so the temperatures, like Lee said, have been unprecedented in terms of how warm they've been. Uh, I've been coming up to this region now for the past 20 years, and this is the warmest I've ever seen it. And uh, we had some areas that were as warm as 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, very unprecedented. 50, that's incredible. Okay, let me uh, look and see if there's anything else from our audience here. Does anybody want to ask their questions live feel, or feel free to type them in there if you want to ask something. Or you can take your microphone off and also ask it. Oh, quiet out there. Quiet group. <laughs> You've all been reading the blog. Yeah, now you should quiz them then, Piper. <laughs> uh, so what is, um, I'll ask you. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kelly, so one of our Benthic team members just asked me what's my favorite thing about being being at sea um i think really just seeing how all of the research comes together as one thing um, a lot of times you'll, you'll read research and it's all of this like kind of you know somebody's a plankton person somebody does mammals somebody does oceanography and it never really melds together um but with this trip it's really seeing how researchers collaborate, um, seeing how it all kind of comes together to look at a bigger picture of an ecosystem is really cool. Um, and again, just like making the connections and really meeting all these people who are really passionate about what they do and 
being cool about letting me jump in and ask like a ton of questions. So everybody's been really great. Cool. Uh, and has your class started uh, yet or um, yeah, where are you in the school year yet? Uh, my students don't start till September 4th. Oh, okay. So we've got a while. So that's yeah. what, uh, oh. your, uh, um, Kevin. But they have been. Go ahead. Uh -oh. We're losing you. Um, we have a question. Kevin wants to know, have you been in contact with your students? Yeah, I have been. Um, they have uh, an, a summer assignment, so they'll be doing some work um, on actually looking at the DBO and some of, and how it basically pieces together. Um, so they're going to pick a couple of different aspects of the research from the blog, actually, because the blog has a lot more um, of the research on there than what I mentioned in this webinar. And so they're going to look and they're picking two things and then they need to basically just or um, explain to me how those two pieces of research um, are related, how they um, use each other's data, and how it all relates uh, to the DBO. Um, so they have been reading the blog, um, and they are doing some assignment stuff. So um, they, they've been having a good summer <laughs> with that. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so what is your plan now? What, uh, where do you go from here and how much longer are you at sea and how many more samples and all that good stuff? Yeah, so we're doing some sampling tonight. Um, so we'll be doing some Van Veen grabs and collecting some water samples um, for our oxygen 18 isotope study that Dr. Lee Cooper is doing. Um, so we're doing that tonight, um, kind of starting this afternoon, hopefully, um, and then into the night for that. And then we should be um, outside of Nome on Thursday, and then we're all getting off the ship on Friday the 23rd. So um, that's the plan, but I've learned that the plan isn't always the plan. So <laughs> we are going to be flexible about when that actually happens, but that's the plan right now. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, you guys will be uh, maybe excited to hit hit land here soon and actually walk. It's been a long time on a ship. Um, we have a question from Connor. He says, will you add anything that you've learned from your trip to your own curriculum at STA? Oh, hi, Connor. Um. <laughs> It's a former student who just graduated. Um, yeah, for sure. So, um, well, you took marine bio, so I'll definitely be using a lot of this um, stuff in marine bio, um, particularly some of more of the ocean chemistry um, and some of the uh, oceanography and benthic organisms that we didn't really get to in that class. Um, and we'll do a little bit of that. Um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about moorings as well and some of the instruments that are used in uh, some of the scientific research that we don't really talk too much about. Um, I've also learned a lot uh, of lab procedures and some of the ways that uh, science is done in um, a different kind of lab. Um, so I'd like to bring some of those things back to students as well and give them um, a, a different kind of hands-on experience with some new lab procedures. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, hear, uh, I see Linda. Yeah, yeah. Linda's asking a question. Is her daughter there? Yeah. Yeah, Nicole is here <laughs> and she's waving at you, Linda. So she's <laughs> she's here, yeah. <laughs> And if Linda uh, would like to stay on after this event, when we stop the recording, you're welcome to open the mic and say hi to her in a moment. Um, okay, let me see any other questions coming up. If not, in the meantime, while well, people are maybe thinking a little bit more um, about what they might want to say or not, um, we just want to let our audience know that this event is being archived or recorded and we'll post the archive online and share it with everybody in a couple of days if you registered and uh, also if you want to use it later with students or anything down the road. Um, looks like got a couple more messages coming up. Uh, 
Let's see, Tyler wants to say, he doesn't have a question, but just wanted to say that he's very excited about all that you've done on this trip. And Kevin wants to ask, how has the bandwidth Hi, been for your... <laughs> And Kevin wants to ask, how has the bandwidth been for your post, uh, posting your blogs? This is Judy. Um, Piper, when you respond on the uh, chat. It's been okay. It takes a long time to kind of upload photos. I, I have a lot of really cool videos, which I'm planning on posting when I get back. Sorry, go ahead, Piper. Yeah, oh yeah, it's, yeah, I see that now, Judy, thank you. Um, yeah, so the bandwidth has been okay. It takes a really long time to post. Yep, uh, bandwidth has been okay. It takes a really long time to post like photos especially. Um, so, and I have a lot of really cool videos which I'm planning on posting um, when I get back to shore because um, videos do not upload at all. So no videos, but um, it just takes a while. You gotta be patient and I just do it kind of in, at night when hopefully nobody's on the, on the internet. You just gotta time it right. Very good. All right, well, um, we wanna thank everybody for joining us today and thank you for the Healy for helping Piper and Dr. Cooper and Jet and Dr. Grebmeyer get this uh, webinar um, situated. You guys did an awesome job. Um, I just, for the record, I want everybody to know that we tested this a uh, couple days ago and we actually had video. So I was the one that got to see Piper and Lee and uh, the Healy team. So I do know that they exist. It's not just their voices out there. Um, again, thank you for uh, joining us today. And if you um, want to stay on after we um, uh, stop our recording, we'll, be, we'll let you all uh, say hi to everybody. Um, good job to the team. No, they just like talked about it.